We thank you, Lord, for this time to gather again in your house. We ask that, um, that you would lead this time of study by your spirit, that you would draw us closer to yourself, and that we would understand you better by understanding your word. We thank you for all of the shadows that you gave that pointed to Christ and pointed to salvation in Christ. We ask that, uh, that we would grasp that, hold it, and cling to it today and always. Lord, we lift this to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, so we're going to do a quick, 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 quick review of what we've done um, or what we started with the, with the temple um, or the tabernacle, not the temple, sorry. So um, all, the, all the tribes were around this large um, outer court. The outer court was about the size of um, half of a football field. So this is very, very large. It's very interesting as we think about this is God's dwelling place. And we're going to see how it, it starts and it keeps getting more and more, um, uh, not condensed, but, but what? Compact. Compact. Compressed. Compressed. I'll think of the word at three in the morning and send out a text. No, I'm just kidding. So, <laughs> mass group text. <laughs> the word is. <laughs> um, so, so it, but every single layer has, um, has something, um, or there is a layer until we get to the very presence of God's dwelling place. So we're going to, we're going to keep getting closer and closer in. So, and it's interesting to note that in Exodus, the way that um, the instructions are given, it actually works from inside the holiest of holies out. So we're doing the opposite. Instead of working from the inside out, we're working from the outside in. Um, no great purpose to that other than it's how we're flowing. So, um, so this is this outer court is surrounded by um, by a, a, a fence, um, a, a fence of cloth, a cloth fence, and then you have we have the altar on which we have those sacrifices that are are brought before the Lord. We then have the laver, and once the priest. Um, once the people bring their sacrifices, then the priest takes over. The priest has to wash his hands, wash his feet, um, be purified before entering into the most holy place. So, um, so now we have the most holy place. And this is on that picture that has been with the, uh, with the announcement for this study. Um, the picture shows this big outer court, and then it shows this tent in the middle. That's the most holy place. We have the most holy place, the tabernacle, where um, this was actually split into two, where we have most holy place and then the holy of holies. And we're going we're gonna to look at both of these. So, da, 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 da. hold on a second here. Oh, yeah, I separated my pages, but they're in order. Okay, <clears throat> so the most holy place then, um, we've got within it, we have, um, let me make sure I have this right. Okay, I want to make sure I have, because my, remember our map is sideways um, for ease of my brain. Not that I can look at this. It's, I know, I know. Um, so we have the, uh, the lamp stand um, right over here. It's not a square, but it's a square for our purposes. That's the lamp stand. Okay. Now, the lampstand, um, <clears throat> this is, uh, it's told in, or it's, the instructions are given in Exodus 25. Um, let's go to Exodus 25, but I don't know that we'll stay there long. So, in Exodus 25, 
it's very interesting. We find that um, that this lampstand, we don't have exact measurements on it, but we do know that it's one piece. It is all hammered out out of one piece of gold. So there wasn't extra welding putting these things in place. You can recognize what the lampstand um, looks like. Uh, it looks, so you've got the lampstand, and this is, we don't know exactly what it looks like. And then they've got three branches coming out here, three branches coming out here. And so we've got the light, the light, the light, the light, the light, light, light. It's a menorah. It is a menorah. This is the lamp stand that was in. I've got some commentary on my menorah drawing. Is that? <laughs> um, so, so the lamp stand was always lit. It, it was a single piece. There are very specific decorative aspects to the menorah. Um, actually, we'll keep it on here for just a second here. Um, <clears throat> so uh, it was fueled by oil. In scripture, it talks about how it needs to be fueled by olive oil. So this was fueled by oil instead of wax. Um, and also we see with the menorah, there is purpose there's meaning behind these seven, seven lights. Um, it has the six branches and then that center light. And in scripture, seven often symbolizes um, perfection or completion. And so we know that God created the earth and rested in seven days. So the, the all of creation was completed in seven days. Um, we know that the uh, number seven denotes the completion at the crucifixion. Uh, you may have done a study prior or in the past uh, on the, the last seven words of Christ. Um, and so we know that that his earthly duties had come to a completion through those seven words he utters. Or, or states in agony from the cross. Um, when Jesus was asked by his disciples how we should pray, he gives them the Lord's Prayer. How many petitions are in the Lord's Prayer, which is a perfect prayer? There are seven petitions in the Lord's Prayer. So, so seven, there is not uh, no coincidence um, or just happen chance of why, why we have all of those uh, those lights burning. The priest had a very important role in trimming the wicks, making sure that the light was always burning. So that was one of the roles that the priest would uh, would have here. And think about this. So as you know, this is the outer court, and so the sun shines down here. Um, when they enter into this tent, it's dark. And so they have a light shining, um, and it provides, provides light in this dark room. Well, guess what? We have, in the Christian church, we understand the light as something very, very meaningful, as something very important. Let's go to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, just starting right in the uh, first chapter. This is in the New Testament, the uh, fourth Gospel. We're going to just start in, um, in chapter 1, verse 5, where it says, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Let's go over to John 8. John chapter 8. And we'll go to verse 12, John chapter 8, verse 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Let's go to chapter 12 of John. Chapter 12, verse 46. Jesus says, I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me should not remain in the darkness. So Jesus shines 
much like this menorah, even greater so than the menorah, Jesus is the light within the darkness of this world. And he didn't, he didn't extinguish that light when he was crucified. That light was not extinguished. It did, um, it did return in his resurrection, and it is within the church. Let's go over to the Gospel of Matthew. So you're going to go backwards um, to the very first Gospel, Matthew, and we're going to go to chapter 5. We're going to hang out in the New Testament for just a couple minutes here. So chapter 5 verses 14 through 16, where Jesus is talking to the disciples. He says, you are a light of the world. A city bit built on a hill cannot be hid. No one after lighting a lamp puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. What happens in a baptism, right? After the child or the adult is baptized, a light is lit from the Paschal candle, from the Easter candle. A, light is, a, a, a candle is lit, handed to the parents, if it's an infant, or to that adult, and they're reminded that as a Christian people, Christ's light shines in us. And that light then shines to the world. And we don't hide that as a Christian people. So, so just as this lampstand lights that dark room, the most holy place, Christ is the light in the world and he gives us that light to be light in the world. We're going to keep with that going to Ephesians. So if you go past the Gospels, past the book of Acts, past um, uh, 1st and 2nd Corinthians and Romans and Galatians, you will come to, uh, or Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, then you're going to come to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. If you've never done a word study on light, I encourage you to, um, to do that. If you ever, as a New Year's resolution, decide to do a, a word study and, and really study and hone in on one word of Scripture for, for a year or for a month, um, I encourage you to do light because there is a lot on light in, um, in God's Word for us and a lot of, um, of how Jesus is the light, and then he moves us through his Holy Spirit to be light in the world. So Ephesians 5, chapter, uh, or chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. For once you were darkness, notice that does not say you were in darkness. For once you were darkness. Think about that. We are born with a nature of sin. We are born as children of wrath, as enemies of God, as blind. We were born um, darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. There's no question there. There is no question as to who we are in the Lord. We are light. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. So again, we see that word um, of the light that is within us, that we are now light, we hold that light, we are light, and we are not to keep it to ourselves. We are to bring it forth into our everyday, everywhere lives. Let's go to Philippians. So it's just the very next uh, book. We're going to go to Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. Where again, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul writes, Do all things without murmuring and arguing, so that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation in which you shine like stars in the world. It is by your holding fast to the word of life that I can boast on the day of Christ that I did not run in vain or labor in vain vain, shining like stars. And he's talking about being in the midst of this perverse, dark generation. So just as um, the light lit that dark room, 
Jesus is the light of the world. He gives us his own light so that we are light in this world and we do not keep it to ourselves, but we go on. And that's not all. If we go to Revelation, so go all the way to the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 21, and we go to verse 23. And this is this is just beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. Does anyone else have goosebumps? That is just glorious, absolutely glorious. The priests of ancient crossed into the darkness and they tended to the light. Jesus came as the light and he gives us and makes us light. And so we tend to the darkness of the world through his light that is in us. And we are promised for the eternal that there will be no darkness that it will only be light. And what is the source of our light but the Lamb, the Lamb who is the lamp itself. Oh, still goosebumps. Mm, just awesome. Um, okay, so we have, we have in the most holy place, we have the lamp stand, and then we have, we're going to turn my map sideways, remember, got to do this. Um, okay, lamp stand, then we have um, the table of showbread over here. And there we go. So we have the table of showbread. This is found in Exodus um, 23. Uh, wait a second here. I think Exodus 25, 23 through 30. I have 23 through 30, but I don't think there are seven chapters on the table of showbread. So I made a whoopsie in my notes. Um, so Exodus 25, let's check this out and make sure. Um, yep. Verses, verses 23 through 30. And um, so on this table was the bread of the presence. The bread of the presence, that was 12 loaves of bread that were representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And the loaves reminded Israel of God's provision um, and, and his continual provision. If we go to Exodus um, 16, we don't need to go there. We, we'll just talk about it. So in Exodus 16, we see how God provided food for the Israelites as they began their journey and they were grumbling and they were hungry. And so he provided food for them. He provided manna and then he provided quail to boot. And so he, these loaves reminded Israel and remind us of God's continued provision of food and sustenance for his people. It's also, um, it reminds Israel of being in God's present, uh, presence. So the bread was made holy because it lied in the presence or was lying in the presence of God. It was in the most holy place. And by being in that most holy place, um, it, was, it was before God as he manifested his presence in the temple. And so, um, so it was a reminder that they are always before the Lord. The bread was set regularly. Every Sabbath, new bread was placed on this table of showbread. And the other bread, the previous week's bread, that was eaten by the priests, by Aaron and his sons. So, so the priests were fed by this, and, and it was the holy bread. This, um, this was the bread that David ate. So let's go to 1 Samuel. Um, we'll pass the... Uh, We'll pass the Pentateuch, so past Deuteronomy, past Joshua, Judges, and then we come to 1 Samuel. We're going to go to 1 Samuel chapter 21. So this is where Dan, uh, David is, is on the run. 
Saul um, has been overcome with wickedness. He is seeking to capture David. He seeks um, after David. And so David is on the run. And we pick up in verse 1. I want to make sure where I am. Oh, yeah, remind me. Oh, no, 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 we're good. I was going to say we need to go back, but no, we're moving forward. Okay, so verse 1. Um, David came to Nob to the priest Ahimelech. Ahimelech came trembling to meet David and, David and said to him, Why are you alone and no one with you? David said to the priest Ahimelech, The king has charged me with a matter and said to me, No one must know anything of the matter about which I send you and with which I have charged you. I have made an appointment with the young men for such and such a place. Now then, what have you at hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever is here. So David and his guys are hungry. They need some food. The priest answered David, I have no ordinary bread at hand, only holy bread. Only the bread of the presence, provided that the young man have kept themselves from women. So as long as they've been sticking in the law. David answered the priest, Indeed, women have been kept from us as always when I go on an expedition. The vessels of the young men are holy, even when it is com a common journey. How much more today will their vessels be holy? So the priest gave him the holy bread, for there was no bread there except the bread of presence, which is removed from before the Lord to be replaced by hot bread on the day it is taken away. Jesus, when he is being called out for his disciples, plucking the grains of wheat and eating on the Sabbath, Jesus tells or retells of this story saying, David ate of the bread of the presence. And it is not, it is not wrong for my men to eat. Um, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. So not only is he the Lord of the Sabbath, but we have the show bread here or the bread of the presence. Well, Jesus is the bread of life. So let's go to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, that's again the fourth uh, gospel in the New Testament, fourth book in the Testament, Gospel of John, chapter 6. And we're going to go to verse 31, or began at 31. So if you could see my notes, I have John 6, 31 through 35-ish. Because there's a lot about Jesus being the bread of life in this chapter, and it goes into amazing, amazing teaching on communion. But I, I don't think we're going to go there right now. But clearly, we cannot not talk about communion with the bread of presence. So, okay, so John 6, 31. Our ancestors uh, ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The bread of life is eternal. The bread of life is sustenance, this side of heaven, for the eternal. Jesus is the bread of life. When we talk about, um, or when we have in our service, those words of institution where Jesus takes the bread, he gives thanks. The thanks that he's giving, that would be regular thanks that a Jewish person, a Hebrew, an Israelite would give before their dinner, before the breaking of the bread. He gave thanks and then he said that this is my body. He is saying he is the bread of life. He is the presence, um, the, the bread of the presence. We know that Christ is the bread. Christ is the wine. The bread, the wine, are Christ's body and blood. So much like the lampstand, there is a lot to be seen in the shadow that is the table of the bread of presence, the table of the showbread. We see that this is foretelling of the bread of life that is to come. 
It is the sustenance. I know um, when we were doing the academy class on the sacraments and solas, and this is before COVID, and, uh, and I had asked the question, when you don't have communion, who, who misses it? And everyone raised their hand, and then, then we had COVID. And the one thing that I think that we missed so dearly, I mean, not the one thing, because we missed a lot dearly, um, we missed receiving Christ's body and blood. We need him continually sustaining us. His body, his blood, it is the tangible forgiveness that we receive, the tangible forgiveness that we are in the presence of God, that he abides in us, we abide in him. So, um, so Jesus, as the bread of life, Jesus, the, 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 the table of the showbread pointing its way or pointing our way to Jesus and seeing um, who he is, we see the, the, the symbol there or the, the shadow of what is to come. Then we have the altar of incense. So we have the lampstand, we have the table of showbread, and then we have the altar of incense. Um, hold on, is it S? No, C. <laughs> I, I couldn't remember which one came first, the C or the S. Um, so we have the altar of incense. And this right here is the veil. Okay? We're going to talk more about this, but, but I just want us to realize where this altar of incense is placed. It is right before the veil. So let's go to Exodus. I'm just going to see if we need to keep our hand here at John. We don't. Okay, so let's go to Exodus chapter 30. This is the second book in the Bible. Second book in the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 30. We're going to jump a little bit in here. We're not going to read all of the building details, but we are going to read some details. So we're going to start with um, chapter or verse one, where it says, you shall make an altar on which to offer incense. You shall make it of acacia wood. And remember that acacia wood is that very strong, steady, durable wood. Then let's jump down to um, verse seven. Aaron shall offer fragrant incense on it. Every morning when he dresses the lamps, remember the lamp that he's tending to that, um, he shall offer it. And when Aaron sets up the lamps in the evening, he shall offer it. So twice a day that incense is being offered. Uh, a regular incense offering before the Lord throughout your generations. You shall not offer unholy incense on it or a burnt offering or a grain offering, and you shall not pour a drink offering on it. So remember, out here, we have that altar on which the offerings are made. The grain offerings, the burnt offerings. The, this is where the people bring their offerings. This is another, another place, but this is the altar of incense. This is not to have unholy um, fire upon it. This is where... Um, well, we'll get to that in just a second. So there's a very, we're going to stick in 30 right now. There's a very specific uh, recipe that we have. Exodus 30, we're going to jump down to verse 34. So Exodus 30, 34 through 38. The Lord said to Moses, take sweet spices, stockti and onica and gal uh, galbanum, Sweet spices with pure frankincense, an equal part of each, and make an incense blended as by the perfumer, seasoned with salt, pure and holy, and you shall beat some of it into powder and put part of it before the covenant in the tent of meeting where I shall meet with you. It shall be for you most holy. When you make incense according to this composition, you shall not make it for yourselves. It shall be regarded by you as holy to the Lord." Whoever makes any like it to use as perfume shall be cut off from the people. So this incense is for the Lord only. 
It was not to be used as something to please man. It was not to be anything other than the exact recipe of what he gave them, of those very specific uh, oils and spices and um, exactly what he wanted. So in Leviticus, if we go over to Leviticus, Leviticus uh, chapter 10, so it's just the very next book, um, Leviticus chapter 10, in verses 1 through 2, Aaron's sons, Aaron's sons Nadab and Abihu, each took his censer, put fire on it, and laid incense on it, and they offered unholy fire before the Lord such as he had not commanded them. And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. God gave them very specific instructions exactly what to place before the Lord. And they had it in their mind that they would place what they wanted to before the Lord. So they brought forth their unholy fire, and they were consumed. Um, they had gone against God's direct command. In Luke, um, it's kind of nice that we have this during the Advent season, in Luke, the first chapter where Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth have been offering up prayers, well, uh, Zechariah was a priest, and he was at the time tending to the altar of incense when the angel appeared to him and said, we've heard your prayers. We, the Lord has heard your prayers. And that's where he tells Zechariah that Elizabeth is going to have John. And so that is exactly where he was. He was before the Lord. And um, the incense is also, uh, oftentimes referred to as the prayers of the people. So when in a modern church, if there is incense, that is representative of this. That is representative of the prayers to the Lord, the prayers of the faithful. If we go over to Revelation, so last book in the Bible again, Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. When he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Let's go over to chapter 8 of Revelation. Chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. Another angel with a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given a great quantity of incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar that is before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. So we see that the prayers of the saints, the prayers of the faithful. The priests are coming before the Lord. They are coming before the Lord to bring a pleasing odor, to bring the prayers of the people, to represent the people before the Lord. It was right in front of this veil. And this veil was what absolutely separated God's dwelling place, God, um, from the people. This, This here is the holy of holies. This is where God's name dwelt. So next, not next week, next week, you can't come in here and sit and look at this either. Next week, we get to see the kids share the nativity story with us. They are going to teach us the story of Christmas. So next week, we're gonna be in the Family Life Center The week after that, we'll be back in here and we're going to end with the Holy of Holies looking at the Ark of the Covenant, the Mercy Seat, and the priest. Okay? And then, of course, who the real priest is. So, anyway, um, I look forward to that and God bless.